about taking an integrated view of what we really need to do with energy. Uh, the present view in my position is quite compartmentalised and people say on the one hand let's collect renewable energy as electricity and on the other hand let's figure out a way to store it in order that we can reconcile differences between supply and demand. And my fundamental view is why don't we think about these two things together and while we're at that by the way let's think about a bit of economics as well because that is also affected by this scheme. So where that brings you is it's very cheap to make very large wind turbines that compress air directly. It's very cheap to store energy as compressed air directly. And something I've only appreciated recently, the onshore wind industry is very mature and the UK doesn't have any, compart any activity in that significantly. And we are not going to have that. It's too late. We've lost that battle. But the offshore industry is in its absolute infancy and the UK and Ireland both have huge resources out there and it's still early enough for them to make an industry in that area. Well, the grand plan is to fire up people's imaginations, uh, to make them realise the, the depth of the opportunity here. Um, it's really unlike anything else. We not only have our own supply of electricity, which is more than our own needs, we also have our own built-in customer base because you and I all use electricity. So the entire market, both sides of it are there. What we're missing is somebody to produce the machines that take that, our energy, for us and give it back to us in a form uh, that, that's amenable to use. There's only one reason why we're not doing it, uh, and it's a difficult one for a human being to come to terms with. Renewable energy at the moment is expensive. And if you ask, is it a good idea to buy a wind turbine and put it up in the sea, will it pay you back? Well, even with the artificial incentives that the government will give you, it takes a very long time to pay you back. And uh, in its own right, if you didn't have these artificial incentives, it would never pay you back. So there's a simple mismatch there. The amount of money it takes to build a conventional wind turbine and put it out at sea will never pay for itself. And all we need to do, you might say, is put up the cost of energy and that rectifies itself. But unfortunately, the consumer, you and me, doesn't want to pay three times, perhaps four times as much for our electricity. That's what we are talking about. Four times as much for our electricity, we could afford to power the whole thing off offshore. And by the way, if we did create all these offshore uh, wind turbines of present design, we wouldn't be able to sell that electricity to the continent because France is powered by nuclear electricity, which is far cheaper than that. I've been a bit abstract. Um, to, in order to make that concrete then, you need a way to extract energy from the wind and you need a way to store <coughs> the compressed air. Uh, the UK has some natural ability to store compressed air already and that comes about because of some great big salt deposits that exist in the North Sea and it's well established that it's very economic to leach out a big cavern inside a salt deposit and pump it full of air and use that as your energy store and the economics of that are really fantastic they're typically and between 50 and 100 times cheaper per unit of energy to store energy that way than pump water up a hill which is the other main contender However, there isn't salt cavern everywhere in the world. Uh, there's certainly very little accessible to Ireland. And I have an alternative suggestion for how you store energy if you haven't got a salt cavern to hand. And that is to make a flexible containment to you and me. That's a bag. Put it in very deep water and fill it up with high pressure air. And the beauty of this is that essentially the pressure vessel is the water outside. All the bag does most of what the bag does is it holds the water out and it keeps the air in. There's a little bit more to it than that because inside the bag you need enough strength to hold the bag down because if you put a cathedral full of air at the floor of the ocean there's a cathedral full of water trying to float its way up to the top and you have to hold that down so I'm not discounting there's a bit of strength required in there as well but it turns out when you do the calculations that it's very cheap. Pumping water up a hill, it's fairly obvious that that stores energy because you can imagine how you could let it back down the hill and you could cause it to turn some kind of a turbine. If you pump air underwater, you're effectively doing the same thing. You're raising the water level. Uh, lots of people have made remarks about, isn't the sea level going to rise if you put all this in? Well, yes, it is going to rise, but there isn't an instrument on Earth that could measure it. Um, we're raising water, in effect, by pumping air down there, but we're also doing something else. We're not just raising the water, we're compressing air from a big volume into a small volume and then allowing it ultimately to, to expand back again. So if you look at what happens when you take a balloon 
um, fill it with air and then let go of it and the balloon whizzes around the room. That's energy, that's stored energy and a lot of it is in compressed air inside the balloon. Ireland and England have plenty of wind but as we all know the wind is intermittent, it doesn't blow all the time and we have lots of occasions when we can go for three or four days and the total amount of wind generation across the country would be less than 5% of its maximum capacity. And that means that if we look forward to 2020, when we think we might be getting 40% of all of our electricity from wind, we're going to be missing that 40% for three or four days at a time. And there's some thinking that maybe if we connect Ireland and England together with a, an electric cable, that that solves that problem. Well, it doesn't because I can guarantee you that if the UK is going without 40% of its supply and at the same time Ireland is going without 40% of its supply, neither side is going to be eager to sell electricity to the other. So we need some way to cater for these eventualities. The, the easy way would be just to have lots of gas-fired power stations standing by. But if you have power stations standing by, it's very expensive. And, uh, and ultimately you are still talking about burning gas, which is a fossil fuel, it makes CO2. You're still talking about burning gas a lot of the time. And my vision is towards a 100% renewable. The other main part of this mission is uh, what's a really good way to get compressed air in the first instance. And if you look at wind turbines and how they have evolved over 35 years, they really started in about the mid-70s with uh, the Danes, in fairness, doing most of the work on these and, and really the Danes have led the show here. And they developed a design which was a three-blade wind turbine. They started playing at around 10, 20, 30 kilowatts. And lo and behold, that design has evolved little by little to still be a three-blade uh, wind turbine that if you look at it from far enough away, looks exactly the same as the ones that we had in the 70s. Only now, they're five megawatts. And something interesting has happened recently, they stopped growing. And they stopped growing for a very good reason, which is skipping the engineering detail. You can't scale them up anymore. And my concept is, well, there is actually a way to rethink a wind turbine, which does scale up. In fact, not only does it scale up, it doesn't work at all at small scales. You have to go to what some people consider an enormous scale, but is in fact the baby of the family. You have to go to 230 meter diameter machines before it even begins to look sensible. And I'm thinking, in my calculations recently, I've, I've been looking at not 232, which would be 20 megawatts, not 340, which would be 50 megawatts, but even as high as 520 meter, which could be a 100 megawatt machine. And everything looks to be possible. So the, the big contrast is your conventional turbine takes all of the wind power and puts it into a turning shaft and then it converts the power from a turning shaft. And my idea is let's not put the power through a turning shaft, let's convert the power internally within the rotor itself. And if you imagine that my arm is a rotor blade turning very slowly, you must imagine that there's a mass internally within that which will be allowed to fall under the influence of gravity and the movement of that mass relative to the blade can be used to convert all the power. And it's not at all obvious when you first describe that why that's a really great idea, but it has to do with conventional turbines turn ever more slowly as you get bigger in size. And the amount of material that you need in that shaft and the amount of material you need in the blade to support these huge loads is going up astronomically.